much as I want it. Okay, cool. All right. Welcome to the Redux Show. This is Rudy Reyes. Gosh, that was abrupt. I don't know if I can get any more abrupt than that, but good afternoon, everybody. This is Rudy Reyes on the Redux Show at WBLZSports.com. It was a great weekend. Hopefully, everybody had a good weekend. For some of those in the sporting world, maybe not so much. Uh, obviously, we won't know uh, LeBron James' commentary in relation to his post-game non-appearance. After the, uh, it, it wasn't a blowout win, but it was a win that was needed uh, for, well, the Warriors. And clearly, Cleveland needed to do something much more than what they were doing running with just one guy. And I'd like to give the bench of the Cavaliers some credit, but unfortunately, their credit has been maxed out. So, not a whole lot there. Anyway, welcome to the Rudolph Show. Good afternoon, everyone. This is something I don't, or let's just say for lack of a better term, it's not something that I have done. And... When I say I haven't done, haven't had a lot of reach in conversation in the golfing world or golfing industry with either a famous golfer or somebody who's written about golf. Uh, and, and the most golf that I know is, well, miniature golf. And I don't think that really qualifies all that well. But and the reason why I, I mentioned this is, is the preface to this. I have a, an opportunity to to talk to a man today who who has grown up with iron not only in his blood but in his hands. And at the very tender age of 10, he was able to uh, uh, acquire something that had been, you know, almost long long reaching and had been long coming as well. This gentleman who obviously you should know and if you don't you should certainly know his book as well, and it is selling out everywhere. I'm live on Facebook, and hopefully those that are listening out there will know exactly who I'm talking about. I'm going to show the book here. It's called Golf Is My Life, written uh, by John Decker. Welcome, John, to the show. How are you? And thank you for taking your time out on a busy book tour headed across country, hopefully getting the word out about this fantastic book that I've about Oh, it's about halfway through it right now. How are things? Rudy, thank you for having me on the show. It's great to be on the Rude Dog Show. I'm uh, really excited, and uh, things are going well. Well, it, it seems like it. Books, be, you know, they, they certainly are flying off the shelf right now. And when I when I first opened this book and I, and I looked at a lot of the preface material, clearly God is first in, in, in your life, and then there's... A golf and family, I think those two run in a close second for you. But this is something that you've been trying to put into a written text for some time. What was your decision to ultimately write this book? And what message were you trying to convey to anybody out there reading the book? Well, first of all, uh, Rudy, I, I never wanted to be an author. As a child, my dream was to be a PGA Tour player. Uh, I grew up uh, just uh, really idolizing Jack Nicklaus, um, and at the um, age of 10 um, or 11, I got to go to Augusta for the first time, which was a, a really neat experience, and, and go to practice around the Masters. And I knew at that moment I wanted to be a PGA Tour player, but as, as life kind of works out and as I chased the dream to be a player, I uh, moved down to Orlando, Florida, and I became a teaching instructor. And when I started working at the Grand Cypress Academy of Golf and started teaching the game, um, I started noticing that stories started forming in my mind, and they were like seeds. They kept growing, and um, after about 10 years of teaching, I knew that God wanted me to write a book, um, and uh, I went to my director, who is Fred Griffin, who's a top 100 teacher, one of the top teachers in the country, and, and uh, works with tour players, and um, and and so... 
I told Fred, I said, Fred, you know, I think that uh, God wants me to write a book. And, and um, he said, well, you'll know when the time is right. And four years ago, I started the book. Uh, and it took me four years to write as a first time author. And I'm real proud of the of the journey. But, uh, you know, the title Golf is My Life, the idea was to show how golf and life are similar. But the subtitle is glorifying God through the game. And, and this book is a Christian book. And this book is written to glorify God through the game of golf, through stories about personal experiences with guys like Tiger Woods and Seve Ballesteros and Payne Stewart. Um, guys I grew up with, like Brad Johnson, he was a Super Bowl winning quarterback with Tampa Bay, and Brad Darty. Uh, I used to sit beside Brad Darty in algebra class, and he's the number one pick by the Cleveland Cavaliers. Um, I'm sure Cleveland might want to have him right now. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's been a great experience, and, and uh, for someone who, who dreamt of being a twig to, to have, you know, to now have written a book, I'm I'm really excited, and I hope the readers will enjoy the stories. Well, I look. I'll be honest with you. I can appreciate this book. I really, truly appreciate this book. I look at all the different things. I look at all the variety. Of course, you mentioned Cleveland, and they need somebody not named LeBron James to play for them. And what's really interesting uh, about LeBron James is, is that there wasn't anybody to to rescue him. Maybe it was something that he was uh, basically looking forward to having that would be helpful to him yesterday as a loss to the Golden State Warriors. But you're talking about the book, and the book seems it, it seems so well versed. It's almost as if if you close your eyes and you look at the variety of of stories from your brother having autism, being recognized as having such, to your own personal trials in school, running through, you know, in, in a very young age, of course, thinking, well, what is the N word? What does that mean? And of course, you had mentioned Tiger Woods, and and we can we're going to touch on Tiger Woods for for half a second, but uh, or in a moment rather. But I want to discuss more so about the book and your dad being a former athlete, your mom being a former athlete. So this runs in your blood. When you started out, you wanted to play golf. You wanted to be in the PGA. You thought you had the skill set. Uh, and it was almost as if, and again, if I close my eyes, I look at it, and I think to myself, okay, if I was 10 years old, who, who would I want to emanate? You know, who would be... The, the person to emanate. If I was a if I was a kid, and let's just say the roles reverse, I was ten, and you're in already in your thirties. If there was anybody that I wanted to emanate with, it would probably be you. Why? Because of the experiences, because of the things that you dealt with growing up in North Carolina. Uh, you dealt with uh, a, a lot of adversity of your own, as well as those surrounding you dealing with their own adversity by doing things that we know today as Christians aren't exactly the right thing to do. What was it about the onset of this book? And did you believe, was there any rewritings? I mean, I know you had to rewrite at least very small segment of this book overall because it's so thick and rich, you know, rich in context, well over 257 pages of just great stuff. But what was your forethought? I know you wanted to be somebody on the road, you know, playing with the likes of, uh, you know, gosh, the the, the list uh, prior to Arnold Palmer's passing, of course, probably playing alongside someone of that great stature. But what was it about wanting to write this book that you felt uh, had to be told? Well, I knew um, something was going on because the stories that I had in my mind would not leave. Some of the stories, like Augusta, the chapter one in my book is titled Augusta. That story was in my mind for 20 years. And it just kind of stayed there. Uh, and it would just, it would come and I could be carrying on a conversation and the story would kind of come across my mind. And as I had the conversation, it would just get added. Uh, there would be little bits that would be added to it and, and I just would file it away. I never took one note for the book. It was all in my mind. Um, and, and the experiences I had. Um, some of the stories, chapter uh, 15, want, uh, was downloaded into my mind in minutes. Uh, as I was watching 60 Minutes, it was literally like the Lord was just opening up my mind and said, here's the story. 
So some of them came to me very quickly. Most of them took time, uh, and that's kind of the way life is. But, I, what, you know, you talk about the rewrites. The last chapter of my book, Lost and Found, my editor is Pete McDaniel. Pete McDaniel has been writing uh, for Golf Digest for 20 years and was Tiger Woods' personal writer. Anything that you saw while Tiger Woods and Pete were working together that was in print, Pete McDaniel wrote. And Pete had me rewrite the last chapter six times because it, it took a long time for that, uh, that that chapter to really get established because he didn't. He said, you know, you need to redo it. You need to redo it. So there was a lot of rewrites on that. Originally, when I first wrote the first five chapters of the book, when I went back, I looked back at it after about a, about three or four months, and I went back and I read the first four or five chapters. And I said, you know, this is not really as good as I thought it was. The material's there, the information's there, but there's no flow to it. So I started praying before I started writing. And for the first time in my life, I understood what the Holy Spirit was. The Holy Spirit is God Almighty living inside of me and allowing me to, uh, speaking directly to me. And once I started praying and and once I started writing, after I started praying, praying my writing went in directions that i've never i could never have imagined the storylines I, I just kept saying to myself go with it go with it go with it my pastor in ohio uh recommended that i add scripture and then i added scripture in the beginning then i tell a life story and then i tell a golf story and the holy spirit um really is is who i I credit for uh, writing uh, this book because, again, this was not what I wanted to do with my life, uh, and uh, but I give all the credit and the glory to God. You know, I, I I produce, I write my own material, and sometimes I get in the flow. You know, I'm I'm really focusing, yeah. I'm honing in on the message, and your message was to help others see that whatever sport you're playing in, albeit football, which you're clearly aware of dads to play for the Demon Deacons, and your own experiences playing football as well as basketball. But I want to take a step back where you were talking about Tiger Woods. I'm not going to go on too much about this. I've already kind of had yeah. my fill of uh, the, the cat catching my tongue. But Tiger mm. Woods is is a fallen from, from grace story. And I know that uh, there was a foreword uh, written, and you had conjunction with with Tiger Woods and his publisher and such. But what are your thoughts on Tiger Woods? Can is there any probable way from a mental standpoint, and is there a way he can come back from all of this? I mean, is it is is Christianity his answer? Is it something that's going to help heal him in the process? I mean, he had lost his dad. Uh, his career taking a tumble. He tried to make a comeback and then another tumble. Is he on the road to recovery? And if so, can he come back and play like everybody has seen him play in I don't know how many title games uh, wearing green jackets associated with his history? Well, the first thing I'll say is, you know, it's not. The first thing is, is I, I I was not put on this earth to judge other people. Uh, I know that for a fact, um, um, and so I can honestly say that had I had the talent that Tiger Woods uh, had as a child and had gone on to have the success that he had done, I probably would have fallen into a lot of the same uh, traps that he did. Um, I mean, I, I, I had my share of, of mistakes that I made, and, and I didn't have the fame and fortune that he did. Uh, with that being said, absolutely, Tiger Woods can come back. I believe that if Tiger Woods accepts Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, that he could come back and probably win another five or ten majors. And the reason I, I believe that is because God created Tiger Woods as probably, and Jack Nicklaus and some of the the elite players, uh, and, and you could go, talk about the Michael Jordans and the LeBron James, created them for excellence, okay? It's when they get in there, it's when they fall into the traps of the world or they do not acknowledge that their creator created them for that. The problem that we all have is called pride. And we start talking about what we've done, how we've worked and how we've done this and how we've done that. And we start putting, pushing God and the creator out of what we do. And it happens in all, all of us are guilty of this. 
well, you, you could be a financial consultant and making a lot of money and you start thinking about how you've, you're, you've done all these things or you can be an entertainer and you're on top of the world and everybody adores you. And we start looking at our lives and I fall in those traps. I made idols of my house. I made idols of, uh, you can make idols of your marriage. You can make idols of your children. Uh, you can make idols obviously of money and drugs and all the different things that, that we all fall in guilty of falling into. But I think that Tiger, um, is one of the most, he is the most talented from a physical standpoint, most talented uh, golfer that I've ever seen in my lifetime. The best golfer I've ever seen in my lifetime is Jack Nicklaus. And the reason that Jack Nicklaus won 18 majors is he, it, more than anything, is besides all the talent, he had a winning formula and he never got away from it. He didn't change swing coaches. He didn't go out and do a bunch of crazy stuff. He basically took what God gave him and he maximized it. And I believe that Tiger is still, I mean, Tiger's 41, I believe. Uh, he still has time. You look at Mickelson and all the majors he's won after the age of 40. But I believe that until Tiger gets that part of his life straightened out, his relationship with God, where he sits down and gets down on his knees and says, you know, thank you for, I, you know, ask for forgiveness for his sins. And, and this is, you know, I'm going to turn my life over to you. There's not a doubt in my mind that if he did that, he could come back. And, um, you know, that's a decision that he'll have to make. I'm, that's my, uh, that's my perspective. And, and I know that there are probably people out there that maybe will stop at that. But um, I, I, you know, I don't judge Tiger because I definitely want to see him come back because I think he's not only do I want to see him come back because I want him to be healthy and I want him to, to maximize what God's given him, but he is so good for the game of golf. Uh, I mean, when he is in a tournament, there's 30 percent more people uh, there. When he is in a tournament, there's more eyeballs. He pushes the needle. He pushes the needle. So people want to see him. And, and so I'm, I hope that for, for his sake and for the sake of golf, that he does get back on top. Uh, I do as well. I certainly don't condemn him at any point whatsoever because only God can judge, and I'm just here to observe. And, and that's really how I look at it. Sure. And I think of Tiger Woods, and I think to myself, man, you know, where – why has he fallen? And you had stated that that we always seem to put other things first. We don't put the Lord first. And just an FYI for all the listeners out there, the watchers out there currently, my, my software is not working, so I'm only Facebook Live. But I will say this. I currently serve at the church that I attend. I'm part of the broadcast department. And there are a lot of, uh, a lot of challenges, a lot of frustrations. That's broadcast. That's production. That's just how it works. I'm there to serve, I'm there to serve the Lord. And the fact that Tiger Woods wasn't there to serve the Lord, he was there to serve himself. He was there to serve his own deity and his own demons. Certainly has found his way full circle. And now to a point where the biggest question mark is, is how can he overcome this? Well, he can overcome this with Christ. He can, he can, uh, uh, ask better of himself from his spiritual nature, get the required help that he will need. And I will, and I'll say this for the record. If Tiger Woods can make a comeback, this would be the biggest story in sports history ever. Why? Because everybody knows how good Tiger Woods was. But the bigger question yeah. is, will he be? And... With that being said, I want to dive a little bit more in this book. And, of course, you want a great experience, LPGA, PGA Tours, go to SeatGiant.com, gain your experience. You want the best experience, that's SeatGiant.com. So make sure you check them out. Anyway, this is Rudy Reyes. I'm on Facebook Live only on WBLZSports.com, trying to repair the audio problem. Unfortunately, it is not working as of this moment, I do have a call in. Unfortunately, I'm not able to take that call. I am sorry for that, Lou. You're probably wondering where my audio is. And I'm working on it. So, anyway, with that said, audio's being... And I can hear you loud and clear, so there's certainly no issue there. But let's, let's talk about this. Your brother was diagnosed with autism. There were certain signs. And, of course, autism is one of the most commonly uh, spoken about issues in the United States from the standpoint of it's relatively debilitating for some not for all and 
I look at the autism, the fact that he was diagnosed, and I think to myself, and, and most people that don't understand autism will think to themselves, man, how can they, I mean, this is, this is so life-changing, it's so excruciating, it's going to change him forever, and you know what, it does, and it will change people with autism forever, but your brother found himself in a certain situation early on in the basketball realm. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Sure. When, when, you know, Brett was, he was diagnosed with high functioning autism. He's my youngest brother. I'm the oldest of three boys and I have a younger sister as well. And so Brett, um, he, he would, he was never really big enough or strong enough to, to play organized, you know, on the, or, on the high school team or anything like that. And so, but he was, he wanted to be there and he loved to shoot and he could shoot very well. And our basketball coach, but my high school basketball coach, Bill Burroughs, who, coached uh brad doherty and brad johnson and myself and just a lot of great there was a lot of great players that he he coached he actually went to georgia tech as the assistant basketball coach my junior year and then ended up coming back my senior year and so brett asked uh coach burroughs if he could go and shoot on georgia tech's course uh, uh, down in the coliseum down in atlanta and so my high school basketball coach called Bobby Cremens, who actually wrote the forward for the chapter, chapter six, it's called Promises Kept. And, and our whole family went down to Atlanta in the summer and we were, and Brett was going to get to shoot on the Coliseum floor. Well, the day we got there, the floors were being refinished and Brett was, uh, the, the, the assistant coach came out and said, you know, I'm sorry, but you're not going to be able to shoot on the court. But Bobby Crimmins wants to meet with you and your family in his office. And I was just on cloud nine. Here I am in high school. I'm going into Bobby Crimmins' office with my whole family. And we sat there, and Bobby was really, really nice to our family. And he said, Brett, I promise you that if you will uh, come down and see a game this year, I will let you shoot on the court before the game. So our family, Wake Forest, my dad was alumnus of Wake Forest. We went down to see Wake Forest play in Atlanta at Georgia Tech. And uh, before the game, and Dick Vitale's over there, you know, the, the ESPN crew's getting ready. And my little brother, Brett, goes out there on the court. And there's really not – the only people in the Coliseum are the are really the cheerleaders in the band because they have not opened up the doors yet. And so when they – Brett was out there getting ready to shoot, and all of a sudden the doors opened up, and that Coliseum filled up with 8,000 people. I'm not kidding you. In, in less than five minutes, it was completely filled to the rafters. And Brett started putting up shots. And every time he would shoot, if the ball went in, if he switched it or if it went in, they would all cheer. And if he missed it, they'd all go, oh. And so this went on for about five or ten minutes. And we were so proud of him. And and um, and he did really well. He made a lot of – he was he, he made a lot of uh, long shots kind of – Seth Curry like where he was way out there and would shoot and made a few and and so it was really a lot of a lot of fun and, and just a great memory and it's one of the great stories in the book where um and that chapter's got another great story about Arthur Blank about people who uh, who's the owner for the Atlanta Falcons who have made promises to Brett and, and kept them through the years yeah I was reading that and uh, I'm live now here on WBLZsports.com the software is working and everything's well in the universe anyway this is Rudy Reyes on the Rudolph show WBLZsports.com go to cgiant.com and get the experience not just your tickets Arthur Blank's kind of an interesting case and I know a few years ago he was accused of pumping noise into the arena and so on and so forth but, but before that your brother worked for Home Depot, and apparently Arthur yeah. Blank was uh, also working for Home Depot, the higher echelon guy. I think it was director of operations. Uh, I mean, you could probably. Now he was. The, I think it was the CEO. He was the head guy with with Home Depot at the time. Okay, at the time he. Okay, but yeah, but but his his promises and those that you receive from 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 people in general. Look, there's only one promise, and and, and that's Christ's promise. But Arthur Blake yeah. followed suit and said, "You know what? I want to do. I want to do this for. I want to go see Brett." So he traveled to what store Brett worked at and acknowledged yes. him for in his Nashville. hard work in, in Nashville, right? Yeah. And that, that I'm sure you had a very lengthy conversation with your brother after that transpired. What was it about the visit from Arthur Blake to your brother that just made? 
made his life. I mean, it's almost as if it was a fairy tale, so to speak. For it, your was really, <laughs> it was really amazing. It was an amazing story, Rudy, because Arthur Blank used to take lessons from my, uh, from Fred Griffin to, and, and down in Orlando, and he would come down there, uh, uh, you know, once or twice a month, he would come down and take a lesson. And so um, I was ringing in the transaction, and I just mentioned to Arthur, I said, you know, my brother Brett, I said he has high-functioning autism, and he works at the Home Deep Depot in Asheville, North Carolina, and he was, the uh, uh, this past year, he won the Employee of the Year Award, and he goes, really? And so um, he pulled out a little p uh, notepad, and, and he goes, now, what's his name again? And I said, Brett Decker, and he wrote down his name, and um, um I didn't think anything about it. Well, a couple months go by, and it's my it's Brett's 25th birthday, and my dad he calls the house, and my dad answers the phone, and they says Arthur Blank wants to meet Brett today in Asheville. Can you get him in here? And it was Brett's day off, of course, and Brett Brett didn't even want to go in there to see because it was his day off. But Dad's like, you got to go in there. This is Arthur Blank. So Brett showed up on his 25th birthday and the entire store is outside and Brett, the car pulls up and Brett gets out and shakes hands uh, with Arthur and, and, it, and it was real, it was a real neat experience for Brett because he was able to, um, you know, just, he made Brett feel like, a, you know, he was the most important person in the world in front of all his, uh, you know, co-workers and it was a day that he'll never forget. That had to have been life changing. I know um, it was. <laughs> it was kind of interesting. I had inquired with the Steelers. I know I've said this on the show before, and I had this conversation on the show before, and I may have mentioned it before. But it's kind. Of, it, it, it's a similar. It's a similar situation, and here's why. I had traveled to Pittsburgh. Never been there before. Never seen the city, never went to, you know, Tremani. I never never experienced that at all, ever. Didn't know that I would. And so I inquired with the Steelers initially to see if I can get clearance to get on the field. They, they said yes after a relatively long delay. So I ended up flying there to a place I'd never been before, Pittsburgh National Airport, and so on and so forth. I ended up in Latrobe. And here I am entering a field, getting hit by, you know, Tony, well, almost getting hit by Antonio Brown and, and, and Martavis Bryant. I, I thought to myself, this is a dream come true. I don't know who would ever have the ability. So I, I kind of relate to where your brother's mindset was and his feeling of jubilation. Is your brother sure. a, a believer also? I know you grew up in a very strong Methodist uh, household. Was he also a part of the strength in Christ along with your family, or was he... Where was where was his faith at that point? Oh, no, Brett is Brett uh, gone to church pretty much his entire life, and is uh, he's married now, uh, and he has a daughter. Um, she's six year old, um, and her name's Terry Lynn, and um, they um, they go to church every Sunday. And uh, yes, he's a very strong Christian, and you know, Brett has a has a, uh, a job and he, 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 um, you know, helps provide for his family and does a, does a lot of, you know, he's, he's doing a great job as a father. Um, so we're, we're all very proud of him. And, um, and, you know, I think in life, God gives each one of us abilities and it's up to us to maximize. And that's ultimately what we're supposed to do is maximize the abilities that we've been given um, and if we do that, we glorify God. And uh, whether it's our taking care of our body, taking care of our mind or our soul, uh, giving to others, helping other people, uh, there's so many life lessons um, that, you know, from Christianity that translate to golf. Um, you know, golf is a unique sport in the fact that, you know, when I'm out on the golf course, I'm not trying to tackle you or defend you or block your shot or do any of those things. In fact, I'm courteous. I move out of your way. I hold the flag and tend it for you when you're putting from long distances. I help you rake your, you know, rake the sand trap if you hit a bunker shot. Um, there's no other sport that I know of where you go out of your way to help your opponents. Uh, golf is like that. And if we could all, uh, the people who play golf, um, if you can take those same lessons that you learn on the golf course, hopefully you are from your PGA golf professional. And I, that's one thing I tell every, every person that plays the game of golf. Take a lesson from your PGA golf professional 
and make sure that you take a lesson on the etiquette. Because if you get out there and you're you don't know these things, and and a lot of people don't, and you and you're playing with your boss, or you're playing with your coworkers, or whatever, or your friends, and you're doing these things, you don't want to do that. So, you know, the etiquette is very important in, in golf, just like it is in life, and and as, I think that's what makes the book uh, really kind of neat, and and is all the the similarities of the two. Christianity and golf. Yeah, no, it's it. Those those are very linked, and because I look like I said before in the show, everybody who's you know, no, I'm on with with John Decker, who's basically talking about a fantastic book he wrote. Golf is my life, glorifying God through the game. We have John Decker here. John, when I look at golf, I can only watch it on TV for so long. I'll be honest with you, I'm not a golf aficionado. Yeah. Uh, it is not my it is not my thing, but after reading at least I'm halfway through the book right now. But after reading halfway through this book, I actually appreciate golf a little bit more because I'm able to see it through somebody else's eyes, somebody else's mindset, somebody who lived it. This isn't a fable. This isn't you know a, a, a tall tale or whatever everybody wants to call it. But this is more about an experience that you were a part of because this is your book you wrote it through your own life's experiences and such i look at this book and i think to myself i have more of an appreciation for golf than i probably ever have and i'm only halfway through so i can imagine getting to the end of it <laughs> feeling like i've known you know arnold palmer or i've known you know all these other great guys yeah. uh and i i so much so that uh, it gives me appreciate. It's like I want to go grab a club, you know, and go practice or yeah. something. I... <laughs> you haven't even gotten to. I mean, you've got like we still. You still have to get uh, Payne Stewart and Paul Azinger and Seve Ballesteros. Um, so there's a there's a lot of great golfers that that are that are in the you know the back part of the book. Who there's some great stories there. Uh, my relationship with Bob Sowers, who's probably the top club professional in the country. I've been teaching him since 2008. He was on the PGA Tour. And my whole year, I mean, that was my year that I got to experience life inside of the ropes. When I would go to a tour event with him, you know, I coached in four PGA championships. And to be able to walk down the fairway with him during a practice round and 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 have a play a practice round with, with uh, Ian Poulter and Justin Rose and, and, and these guys and be around them and be able to, you know, to, to live the life, um, for one year. It was such a neat experience. So there's all kind of, ex there's all kind of stories in the book that I believe add a lot of sizzle. I believe that God brought all these people into my life to add kind of the sizzle to the book so people say, wow, I want to read a story about these guys. But ultimately it's to glorify God. And that's what I, um, I hope that, that the readers will take from the book. I do as well. I certainly, I, I certainly do take a, a lot from this book, and, and I can't wait to read even more. I've been glued to this thing since seven thirty, and of course, mitigating circumstances, I probably would have finished it by now. But the life of an on-air personality—I didn't have a chance to read yeah. all of it. I know I've had it for a while. Shame <laughs> on me! Shame on me, John! Shame on me! Uh, yeah. But you know, that's uh, that's how. That's how the cookie crumbles, so to speak. Anyway, I have to take a quick commercial break. Hey, John, are you going to sure. uh, join me on the other half of the break? Absolutely. All right, fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Rudy Reyes on the Rude Dog Show, WBLZSports.com, welcoming Mr. John Decker, who's got a fantastic book. I'm here on FB Live, Facebook Live, Golf Is My Life. Glorifying God through the game. You can't get any better than that. I'll be right back. This is Rudy Reyes on the Rude Dog Show and WBLZSports.com. Get your experience. Go to SeatGiant.com today. Use the code Rude Dog and get something off your sale. We'll be right back.
Hey, welcome back to the Rudolph Show. This is Rudy Reyes at WBLZSports.com. Welcome back. We have another half hour or less thereof of a wonderful book by John Decker. Golf is my life. Glorifying God through the game. This is a fantastic book. And welcome back, John Decker. John, how are you? Thanks for joining me in the other half of the break. Rudy, great to be back. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. I was kind of scanning through the other part I have not got to, forgive me, and I look at a note from Craig Kahn, Chief Communication Officer for the LPGA, and I'm just going to quote this passage. In golf, there are instructors, then there are ambassadors. There is no game like it where the mind is actually challenged as much or more than the body. The game is especially challenging for those who are new, potentially intimidated and insecure, and yet seeking positive memories that carry them to the next lesson and beyond. John Decker is a leader. He is a believer in people. He is an ambassador for the game and always carries the hope that goodwill must go along with it. That speaks highly, John. It does to me. Anybody out there listening should speak highly to you as well. It's not very often that you get the type of honesty, transparency through that passage about John Decker. I know, John, you've kind of put training on the back burner to promote this fantastic book. And and when I get done reading it from where I'm at right now, I'll let you know. <laughs> I'll, well, I'll I can't wait. To, I can't wait to get your feedback. Oh yeah, thank it's you. Little, for, and Craig, yeah, Craig. Uh, one of the things that I wanted the book to do is, is, is what you read was actually it's called "As Seen Through My Eyes," and that's Craig King. And and Craig uh, worked uh, for the Golf Channel for I don't know like twenty years. I mean, he was always one of the t- top analysts on the Golf Channel, lead, commentators or, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, did all the the morning drive show, did all of that stuff, and uh, and then he got the job with uh, with the LPGA, and then now he is actually advising people and doing public speaking, uh, and he's just a fantastic uh, personality, a fantastic leader. Gets, I mean, just public speaker, and um, I've learned a lot through through uh, my relationship with with Craig, and I met him down in Orlando, uh, where he currently still lives. But Craig uh, wrote that, and, and I asked, you know, Craig to do it. Bobby Crimmins did one. Brad Johnson uh, did one. Uh, Phil Rogers, who played on the tour, won six tour events, wrote one. Helen Alfredson from the LPGA, she wrote the uh, As Seen Through My Eyes. And what I wanted to do is, is I wanted the reader to get the perspective of the chapter through some of these famous people that I got to spend uh, my time with and grow up with and meet and, and who people who helped shape, shape my career and, and helped me as, along the way. And so I always thought it'd be neat to have, have them lead in. So Bobby Crimmins, for example, his quote and, and was right before the chapter so that you, you will actually meet, as the reader, you'll meet Bobby Crimmins before you come to the chapter and, and the story about him. So that was the idea, um, you know, for that. And Tiger, the one for Tiger Woods was done by Pete McDaniel. And that was probably one of the best ones. Craig's was fantastic as well. Um, but, um, I just, I really think that the readers will enjoy that. I do as well. There's so many, there's so many great stories that you said through the, from, from the beginning, from the onset, you didn't feel as though, for at least in my understanding, as I was reading the book, golf was your primary feel. I mean, once you put the clubs in your hand, it was almost like a destiny in the making. But then, yeah, you watched football and you became enamored by it. And there was a story about Brian Piccolo. And and what's interesting about Brian Piccolo, anybody ever seen Brian's song? I watched Brian's song. What a very touching, very touching and heartfelt oh. movie. Probably one of the best sports movies out there. And I love sports movies because it's fact. There is no fictitious motive behind it. There is no uh, enamoring, I mean, Rudy Rudiger in the, in the movie Rudy, of course, not to be mistaken by me because I've never played for Notre Dame. But... Uh, <laughs> What's what's really interesting about oh. it is that these are so inspirational. No, Lou, welcome to the show. I I 
I, I, I hear you in the background. Did you have a question for, for John about the book or where you can get one? Oh, I, I know, but um, your thoughts about, I was thinking about maybe like your thoughts on the upcoming uh, U.S. Open, though, since uh, Middleton is not going to play. Since, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the last part. Since who is not going to play? Uh, Nicholson, he's not going to play in this year's U.S. Open. I had not heard that. Um, I, I Was it because oh. of – I know that his – was it his daughter? Was it a graduation? Yeah. I heard him talking yeah, about that. Okay. Graduation. That's what it was. Yes, I did hear about that. I'm sorry. Um, you know, the, the, um, the, the thing about the U.S. Open that's so amazing is – the fact that Dustin Johnson, you know, could have two U.S. Opens, uh, could have easily right. won two. Uh, and the fact that he, of all the tournaments, that would have been the one I least expected him to win. But Dustin Johnson, in fact, I have a story in my book about Dustin Johnson, uh, and you haven't got to that part yet, Rudy. Um, I actually got a chance to walk 36 holes with Dustin Johnson when he was, when Bob Sowers, my student, who I was with, qualified for the PGA Tour. They were a tour school. I didn't know who Dustin Johnson was. We got done after 36 holes and I was having lunch with Bob and I looked at Bob and I said, that guy, that guy Dustin Johnson, I said, he's going to win a major because he hits the ball 350 yards with a fade. Most power hitters uh, are wild with their driver. He can drive the ball straight. And that's, I mean, the, to be able to hit the ball as far as he does and as straight as he does and under the much control as he does um, is the reason why he has, you know, a first place and a second place in the, in the, in the U.S. Open. I think, um, you know, the U.S. Open, there's a lot of guys that are, a lot of guys that are playing well. I, I, I kind of like to see, I'm glad to see Jordan is starting to get back. Duffner is a ball striker uh, and winning at Memorial. Um, is was uh, awesome, but I really, for whatever reason, I'm I'm waiting. The one guy that I I predict um, to to come through this year is Ricky Fowler. I think Ricky Fowler is on the verge of winning a major, and it would not surprise me one bit if he won the U.S. Open. Hmm. Yeah, I think Fowler has a good chance of winning. Uh, you think yeah. what, do you think Woods though is done? I mean, because you know his career is uh, taking a no dive, and just when you think he's getting better with his, you know, for his back surgery and whatnot, he always seems to find a way to just like fall further behind. You think Woods is actually done? Uh, well, we talked a little bit about that earlier, and and I think that Woods Tiger's problems. I think that Tiger's problems. Um, he needs to work out his, in my opinion, he needs to work out his relationship with God, uh, first. And that should be the priority in his life right now, because I think that, um, you know, you, everything will lead back. God can heal a back and he can heal uh, a lot of problems, uh, in your life, but you have to acknowledge that he is your creator and he is the source of that. And until that happens, uh, and I don't know, maybe it is happening. I don't know. I'm not on there. I'm not there on a daily basis, but I, I, I feel like from that aspect, if I was advising him, and I know I've talked to Pete McDaniel a lot about this, uh, we both feel that until he gets that right in his life, uh, this other stuff is, is not literally, I don't, I don't see it working out and it's just going to get worse in my opinion. Yeah, I do as well. T Tiger Woods has been there, done that, but. It, it, it's something that you have to not. You have to stop relying on your own, your own faith on man, because there is no faith in yeah. man. God said there is. You cannot put any faith in in man because if you turn away from me, the Book of Isaiah talks about how it flips the script because the hearts of man can deceive you. So you can't rely on that. And when you talk about Tiger Woods, he needs to rely on more than just man because man is what. It, it, because he believes so much and he doesn't uh, have the faith to recognize that there's something more so than what is currently in front of him, faith would be certainly the backing that he would need in order to get him back on track. So hopefully it's something he can do to build his faith. Yeah, well well said. Yeah, I I just, you know, I when, when you hit bottom, you have to recognize that your decision-making processes cannot just be your decision-making processes, that your faith... And, and, and we all take a backslide to, to, to some degree, whether it's something we said, something we should have said, something we shouldn't have done. 
everybody has. So, or not said. you know, nobody is perfect. Nobody is perfect. We all make those mistakes, but God is there. He's our redeemer. He's the one that can take us back from all the negatives and, and the things that we have done, uh, not only to affect ourselves, but to other people. Derek Fisher is another example of that DUI. Hopefully, uh, everybody else, everybody's okay in that, in that situation. And then, uh, Tiger Woods also, hopefully he gets the help that he needs. So, at, at the end of the day, if nothing else, if you don't have faith, you're going to find yourself without. And I think that's what we're stepping away from in sports as well as individuals who clearly some, well, namely yours truly, that don't play sports per, per se. I mean, I I have a good jumper, but that's <laughs> that's about that's all I have. That's all I have. But, no, seriously, uh John, thank you so much. Lou, thanks for the call. I appreciate you hanging in there. Yeah, because I've been having trouble the last couple of days uh, with getting through to you guys. I don't know. I'll be shut up. I'm like, uh, what happened? I, I do something wrong. Dude. It's, uh, you know, like, it wasn't you. It was us. It was a bad situation. Now corrected. <laughs> hey, well, that may, be, that may be true. The guys are inside because we're up and running again. So. Yeah, we're working. We're working on it. Thanks yeah. for the call, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for calling. You're welcome. <laughs> Lou calls in all the time, John, and it, it, it's hard for me not to ask because, you know, he always asks good questions. Sometimes he'll hang on with me for 45 minutes on the show. I, I wish more people were involved as, as much as Lou is. 216-539-9967. I have about 10 minutes left here on the show. John, where can everybody find this book? I mean, you have stuff from uh, Ballesteros, Azinger, Rogers, uh, uh, Sowards, Alfredson. Uh, a teacher, Fred Griffin, uh, you were talking about Brad Johnson. We didn't even touch on the whole Gail Sayers thing. I guess we'll kind of leave Sayers, with exactly. that. Yeah, Gail Sayers, Hall of Famer. There's a, a, a situation where we were talking about Brian, Brian Piccolo and, and, and the Brian Song movie, but more importantly, how it stopped Gail Sayers in his tracks to acknowledge yeah. the question. What was it about that experience for you? And did you feel as if right then and there it was going to be some type of long story or something very short from him because he was in the middle of playing? Well, he was actually hitting. He had just taken a lesson from, and I was uh, just now, and just getting into the teaching ranks. I was I just started at Grand Cypress, and I was actually working out on the range and I was talking with Gail Sayers, and I said, you know, Mr. Sayers, we had a little bit of a conversation. I said, I just want you know to know my my father played at Wake Forest and played with uh, Brian Piccolo, and he immediately paused and he immediately looked at me, and he just said, you know, Brian Brian was a great man, and, and he just kind of got kind of got quiet. And um, the thing that I I I, I learned that from that situation is is sometimes. You don't need to say anything to learn something. I learned, I knew, it. he said everything that he needed to say by the way he looked at me. And, and, and I could tell that he loved Brian and he missed him. And that was just something that, that, that you could tell by his reaction. And so that, that story is, uh, you know, one of uh, the many great, um, stories in the book. But that one, you know, with my father playing with Brian Piccolo and then through that, getting a chance to meet Arnold Palmer and, and all the great people that have gone to Wake Forest University. Um, I really, uh, really like that chapter. And uh, that chapter, the forward for that chapter, was written by Bill Steins, who's the head golf professional at Scioto. That's where Jack Nicklaus uh, grew up playing. But, uh, and, and, but as far as the book itself, you were talking about the, the, where people can, can actually get the book. Um, I would encourage you to go to my website. You can order it on my website. It's a johndeckergolf.com, and I spell my first name J-O-N DeckerGolf.com, and you can. Uh, I have golf videos on there, golf tips. There's about 30 of them up in the top right hand corner. It says videos. Uh, you can also order the book through Amazon or Barnes and Noble. There's three versions of the book. There's a hard copy, uh, there's a soft copy, and then there's the ebook. So you can download the book as well. And um, you know that's a, that's a, a, a probably the easiest way through either Amazon or Barnes and Noble to get the book. Like I said, I can't wait to dive into the rest of this. This book has been very, uh, 
beyond the informative factor and you know i've i've, I've never met a, a true golf professional except for one guy and i think he just won a uh a, a major recently unless i'm mistaken john daly the drinker himself yeah. john daly just won a major to some extent i don't know what it was john yeah, do you know yeah yeah it was on the senior to on the champions tour yes he did okay. and uh and he won two on the you know he won the british uh and the pg and the, the pga uh championship as well so um you talk about a talented young man or now 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 he's not a young man but uh <laughs> a talented man that john daly from a physical standpoint has all the tools he he does i had a chance to meet him he was in ontario california about oh on to gosh, uh, my daughter was only a year old, so that's probably about 10, 11 years ago, somewhere that yeah. John. I had a chance to meet him. I was uh, I was working for um, a hospitality company, and he happened to be there. And I said, "Wait a minute, that guy looks that guy looks familiar. I may have seen him somewhere, but faces and me get along really well." Anyway, I knew who he was. I walked up yeah. to. Him. And I said, John, I said, hey, how are you? Yeah, I'm not afraid, you know, to go up and meet somebody. I don't care who. Uh -huh. I mean, I had um, uh, Deion Sanders, you know, run into my chair while I was eating dinner one time, you know. And I and, surely, <laughs> and, and what's interesting, shortly thereafter, my chair collapsed underneath me. I've never really told that story publicly, but uh, <laughs> but but <laughs> how embarrassing that was. But you, I, you have I, the I, makings of a book, or <laughs> You have the makings of a good book. You know what? I think so as well. I'm gonna I'm gonna really try to put something together. You never know. Probably in the next couple of years or so. But I, I walk up to Mr. Dale. I said I said Mr. Dale. I said how are you? And he said I'm doing well. How are you? And I said good. I said you're here locally to play to play golf, right? You you do golf? Oh yeah, I've been doing the golf every once in a while. He's a little sarcastic. And I said okay, yeah. you know he happened to wear his high waters and you know he had his golf hat on and. Everything I said, yeah. I said, okay, well, that's that's good. And uh, but but the whole time he was there, I'm, I'm I'm not here. I'm not here to judge anybody. Like I said, and you obviously made that mention as well. But John Daly always had a drink in his hand. It, it, no matter where he was in the room, he had a drink in his hand. I thought to myself, I, either he's really thirsty and drinking a lot of water, or you know, the the, the glass is, is glued to his fingers. Anyway, great guy. Love talking to him. It was a great meeting. And uh, I hope he's writing the book probably within the next couple of years. If it's a bestseller, so be it. But I'll leave that to God. You know, I'll allow him to do whatever he's going to do with that one. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, John Decker, go get this fantastic book. I am live on Facebook right now. Golf is my life and glorifying God through the game. John, this is a splendid book. And I know anybody who's going to read this is really going to understand more intrinsically, not only your life growing up, but what makes it more, even more interesting than that, uh, outside of your life in of itself being very interesting, but, but the people you came in contact with, the, the, the physical touch meeting Arnold Palmer and, and, uh, meeting just a, a plethora of great guys, good talent. And it's something I just caught scanning here for just a moment. I, I ran into a very important date in this book. Uh, and if you have the book in front of you, you should open to page 191. I, I'd like to read this for a moment because this this has explicit meaning for me. Uh, I happen to be born on this date. But after uh, September 11, 2001, church worship increased dramatically in this country as people prayed for the victims, their families, and for the relief efforts. In addition, church donations increased. So did military enlistment and volunteerism, blood and philanthropic uh, donations, Sometimes God's plan involves shock to bring his children home. Unfortunately, takes a tragedy to get people back into prayer or church worship. And I, I, I want to close this show with that. Why? Because that's when I was born. Obviously not in 2001, or that'd be a miraculous uh, turn of events yeah. to have my own radio yeah, show here. <laughs> You'd be very mature for a young man, for, <laughs> for a teenager. Got to turn to Benjamin Button <laughs> or something. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Anyway, but yeah, I am 43 years young, and, and when I was scrolling through, I ran into that that excerpt, and I thought to myself, "Wow, that's uh, you. That's that's very true. We were at an all time high. we were, we were hanging flags. It's kind of been on my heart to talk about it. But since since that time, the amount of um, 
I, I want to call it Americanism, and I don't really get into politics. It's not yeah. my wheelhouse, but the Americanism that I seen in this country was at an all time high. Then all of a sudden, people forgot. So the flag started going away, yeah. and the and, and the patriotism was taking a slide, and uh, and and donations dropped, and things of that nature. I think to myself, what is what is wrong? What is the message? that needs to be sent here and and that is don't come together because there's a national tragedy because we recognize it in sports and sporting events we're there we pay tribute we pay homage uh, american uh, service men and women throughout the world uh, it's a part of our military and thank you all for serving uh, but we seem to forget that donations and patriotism and americanism and all these other viable components are very key and I yeah. want to get your thoughts on that John well that that 9-11 chapter 14 it was written to, to talk about the business side of golf and the business side of the church and how um, national like It destroyed the golf business, especially in the resort business where I was for a while. Uh, it was amazing. I, there were a lot of people who were supposed to be coming to golf schools that died in the World Trade Center, and, and I kind of open up uh, that's early on in that chapter. And then it gets into the church side, and you're exactly right. It's very much like with the church. You know, on Christmas and, and Easter, everybody goes to church. But, uh, you know, in the middle of the summer, the church is half full. Um, and, you know, there's certain things, uh, you know, with the patriotism in this country where, where you get a lot of support and then there's times when, when you don't get, uh, the support and maybe you take things for granted, like, like voting, for example, you know, maybe the turnouts were, you know, for certain parties, maybe you're not as high one year or whatever. Um, but I think it's important to, to understand, you know, I'm so proud, uh, first of all, to be a Christian. I'm so proud to have, you know, Jesus, my Lord and Savior. But I'm also very proud to be an American. And so um, I, I think this chapter in the book, I wanted to bring that kind of element um, and, and the patriotic side. Uh, there's also a story about Nathan Kars later on in the book, which you haven't gotten to. Uh, uh, Nathan uh, was I, someone that I did not know, but he died in Afghanistan. And I now play in his tournament every year and part of uh, helping to raise money for that and everything. And so I talk about that story as well. So the book touches, I wanted the book to be more than, I wanted it to touch social issues. I wanted it to touch the game of golf. I wanted it to be able to touch uh, Christianity. I wanted it to touch uh, all the, the ups and downs that we all go through in life and life journey and to show how God used an ordinary man to do an extraordinary thing. That's amazing. John, thank you so much. My hour has been up, but that's okay. It's worth the conversation. This podcast will be posted on the RudeDogShow.com, so stay tuned for that one. It will be uh, available. Uh, I'll tell you what, Golf is My Life is a great book. John Decker writes a great piece here. Uh, just a lot of great information, a lot of great insight, not only in golf, but through golf and Christ in John's life and through his eyes and as he sees it. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in. John, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Not a problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Anytime. We'll get you back on if you happen to come out with a second book. That sounds great. That sounds great. <laughs> or maybe even have you on in it my book. It took me a while for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. It takes a long time. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, this is there Rudy Reyes on the Rude Dog Show at WBLZSports.com. We'll see you tomorrow. Hey, thanks a lot, John. We're not we're not recording anymore. I had to stop the recording. Okay, perfect. It it, perfect. it, it picked up yeah. a little bit over half of it, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the uh, video audio and I'm going to listen to that first.